In my line of work, you get around a lot. Over the years, I've got more and more around. Um, and I was in uh, a place in Israel called the IDC, the Inter Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. Uh, it's a very interesting institution. It's Israel's private university. Um, it's the place where the language of instruction in an Israeli university is English. And therefore it attracts a lot of foreign students. A good proportion of whom are not Jewish. There's an organization I'm sure many of you are familiar with it called Stand With Us. It does a lot of excellent work. And they initiated a program in the IDC called the Ambassadors Club. It was an extracurricular program. Anybody who wanted to could take part in a course uh, teaching you how to be an effective advocate for Israel. So the, the first time they brought me in to speak on this program, um, I came in as a big audience in a proper auditorium, and I was asked one of those questions that if you dress like me, and some of the gentlemen here will be familiar with us, that you come to dread. The question that begins with the words, as a religious Jew, what do you think? And then it can be anything. Yeah. What do you think will, run, will win the 430? You know? As a religious Jew, who do you think I should invest in? You know, like, those outrageous questions get asked just because you wear a funny hat. You know? Um, so a guy asked me a question, he says, as a religious Jew, do you think it's better to use secular arguments in support of Israel or religious arguments? So I said, well, it, it really depends on the audience. If you're speaking to a non-Jewish audience, it's probably better to use religious arguments, and if you're speaking to a Jewish audience, it's probably better to use secular arguments. <laughs> which I think points at what is one of the, the most fundamental problems of effective Israel advocacy today. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm very intimidated to, to share a platform with such, such distinguished speakers as uh, here tonight, and I'm not going to embarrass everybody by trying to say Divrei Torah, but you've already heard uh, Rob Reitowitz talk about the counter-effectiveness of trying to play down who we are and what we are. And I'm telling you that, not from the perspective of a Torah scholar, because I'm not one. I'm telling you that as a nuts and bolts guy who goes out and does this every day. The first thing I want to tell you about effective Israel advocacy is be a Jew. Go out there as a Jew, an unashamed, proud Jew, and talk from a position of an, of an authentic Jewish perspective. I, I was invited once to speak to a group of Norwegian teenagers. Very interesting. I was invited by an Arab tour company in Israel. You know, just like we will often have a token Arab on our tours, so everyone thinks we're broad-minded, they want to have a token Jew. I was a token Jew. Norway has a dubious distinction of being the most atheistic country in the world. 78% of the population of Norway do not believe in God. I'm walking out, I've got 20 you know, Norwegian teenagers there. I'm pretty sure the only other person in the room who believed in God, apart from me, is the Muslim girl wearing the hijab. Right? And that's not going to get me very far. So, but I started off, I said, look, Sweden, right? From outside, nobody knows it from Sweden, Norway. They're all the same, you know. Hinger, hinger, hinger. You know? All sounds the same, right? Yeah. Nobel Prize. Oh, they love that, right? They love being associated with the Nobel Prizes. One Israeli won the Nobel Prize for Literature, a guy called Shai Adnan. And in his accept acceptance speech, it's an amazing story, the story of his acceptance speech, he made the bracha for seeing... Uh, 
Ma uh, Malak Mibasab Adam, a human king. He made the bracha in front of everybody when he saw the king of Sweden who presented the prize. So Shai Agnon, in his acceptance speech, said, my name is Shmuel Yosef Agnon, and because of the disasters, the historical disasters that be, uh, befell the Jewish people, I was born in one of the cities of the diaspora, but I always saw myself as uh, a citizen of Jerusalem. So I said, that's Shai Agnon. My name, is David, my name is David Oleska. I was born in a, a little place no one's ever heard of called Harrogate in Britain. But that was only in a dream. In reality, I was born in Jerusalem. I was exiled by the Emperor Titus. I've been in exile for 2,000 years. I've come home. Get over it. And they were there. I had them. And the reason why I had them, leaving aside spiritual issues, the reason why I had them was because I had engaged them emotionally. And that's the first practical thing I want to tell you about how to be an effective advocate. Jews love information. We love facts. We love statistics. If we get really excited, we, we, we have a PowerPoint presentation. You know. The bad guys don't do that stuff. The bad guys come out and engage your emotions. They tell sob stories, most of which are entirely untrue. I remember being uh, in a debate uh, here in, in, in this city with a man called Norman Finkelstein, who I hope none of you ever have to come across. Um, he is a guy who believes that Israel is worse than Nazi Germany and both his parents are Holocaust survivors, one of those. I debated him here at the University of Toronto years ago. I think there's at least one person in this room who was there at the time. Um, and I can tell you, we kicked his assets. Um, we won. We beat the guy, hands down. And I, I took eight stuff from some very smart people, including the late Sir Martin Gilbert, who was one of the greatest uh, Jewish historians of our generation. And they confirmed what I thought, which was not to try and fight him on his own grounds. The, the guy's a walking um, footnote. You know? I mean, if you read his works, most of his footnotes are just made up. But you know, when you can make up footnotes, you, you seem very impressive. So they said, you know, engage the audience emotionally. He tried to. Um, he, t he recounted a story of a New York Times correspondent who had published his Gaza diary. This was before the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. This New York Times correspondent wrote of a horrific scene he'd witnessed on the, on the beach of Gaza where Israeli soldiers had rolled up in their jeeps and started shooting dead Palestinian Arab children for sport. And they were shooting them with silenced M16 rifles. And he described the eerie and grotesque scene of the soldiers firing and the children falling in complete silence. So I said, you know, um, that's a very moving story, but it's physically impossible. I mean, we're on a university campus here. I, I assume there's a physics department. Somebody go and get someone from the physics department to explain that there is no such thing as a silenced M16 rifle. It's a physical impossibility. The M16 fires a supersonic round. It makes a sonic boom as it travels through the air. I don't know what this New York Times correspondent was smoking, but he did not witness M16s being fired in complete silence. There is no such thing. So he... Norman Finkelstein attempts to engage people's emotions. I countered it with a physical impossibility. It's rare to be able to come back at somebody who's engaging emotion. It's very hard to refute a feeling. I haven't had the opportunity to do so that time. But what I want you to learn from this is when you engage with other people, when you talk about Israel, engage their emotions. You don't engage their emotions the hearts and minds are never going to follow. You start off with their emotions. 
Second thing I want to tell you, I want to do a little mental experiment here. Um, I'll need a volunteer from the audience. Hands up, anyone here who has a brother? Anyone here got a brother? Um, so you're, you're conveniently near the front row, so you paid for the privilege, I see. <laughs> now you're going to suffer for it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Before I ask you a question, sim simple qu uh, thing. Um, one brother, more than one brother. One brother, that makes it easier. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question about your brother. Um, it's going to be a very simple, short question. And the rules are, A, you must respond truthfully. And B, because of the pressure of time we're under, there's a note here telling me not to schlep it out too long. Um, I'd like you to limit your answer to yes or no. Is that, is that agreeable? Okay, so here we go. I'm going to ask you the question, and you will answer either yes or no. Yes. Is your brother out of prison yet? <laughs> and I'll remind you that you agreed to answer only yes or no. I think that's a very appropriate response. <laughs> it's called face palm. <laughs> what have I done to you? Yes, I put you in a catch-22. Uh, or to use the, the formal language, what I, I just demonstrated is what logicians call the fallacy of the complex question. I ask you a question that has an assumption built into it, and because of the very artificial way I, I set it up, you ended up without any uh, means to address the assumption. Okay, you see, you see how it works? It's pretty obvious how it works because it's, it's a very transparent kind of trick. And therefore, it's not really very useful. But what about this? I was on a talk radio show in Champaign, Illinois. I told you I see the world in my business. In Champaign, Illinois, and uh, the host of the show wanted to get the, the, the discussion rolling by asking questions. Then other people would call in with questions. Just to give you historical context, at the time that I was on, I was on this show, the, um, the Prime Minister of Israel was a man called Ariel Sharon. Some of you may have heard of him. So the host of the show says, Mr. Oleska, you're an advocate for Israel. Tell our listeners, what can Ariel Sharon do to bring peace and end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now what, if anything, is wrong with that question? Yes. It's it, not just one assumption, as, as we did with you, um, but it's, it's replete with assumptions. It assumes that as Prime Minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon could do should do and hasn't done something that could bring peace. And those are just the biggies. There's a few more in there as well. In such a short sentence, so many assumptions. But unlike what I did to you, I was trying to trick you. He wasn't trying to trick me. He was just talking about Israel the way people talk about Israel. And once you get into that kind of multi-layered multiple assumptions kind of set up, you're talking about, again, to use the technical language of this business, what you're talking about is something called conceptual framing. A frame is something that contains a limited number of things. What's inside the frame is what we're talking about. What's outside the frame, well, we're not talking about that. Gentlemen. When you're in an argument with your wife, God forbid, and you give her your best line, and she says, we're not talking about that. Uh, you've lost. I mean, you've lost before you started. You know, yeah. But you've lost because she controls a conceptual frame. Whoever controls a conceptual frame controls the outcome of the communication interaction. You want a one-sentence definition of successful advocacy? It consists of obtaining and maintaining control of the conceptual frame. If I can borrow a phrase from a, a very august source, this is the pillar of pillars and foundation of foundations of advocacy. 
controlling the conceptual frame. Whoever controls the conceptual frame controls the outcome of the communication interaction. About a year and a half ago, a year ago in November, uh, I was on a speaker t- uh, here in North America. I was in Kitchener. I mean, you know, I, I do get around it. Um, but uh, the particular incident I'm going to tell you about took place in Miami at Florida International University. I went down there to um, do a training workshop for Jewish students on the campus. And we were in a room on the university campus itself. And one of the student leaders said to me, look, I have to tell you, one of the rules of the campus is if you have an event um, on the campus in in one of the university rooms, then under the bylaws of the university, it must be open to everyone. So the Students for Justice in Palestine, that's newspeak for you, um, they're going to be here. So okay, I'm not scared of them. They weren't just there, they filled up the entire front row. I mean, one of the things you notice about Jewish events is nobody sits on the front row. (laughs) Uh, These guys came, they occupied the entire front row. And about half of them were were as visibly Muslim as I'm visibly a Jew. I thought, I'm not going to stand for this. They've got lists of questions to ask. They're ready to pounce on me. I said, before I begin my presentation, I just want to share with you a personal anecdote. Two nights ago, I was staying at a friend's house in Baltimore. And something happened to me that happens to a lot of men of my age. In the middle of the night, I had to get up and go to the bathroom. Something for the students amongst you to look forward to. Got up, went to the bathroom, came back. I couldn't go back to sleep. I had this irrational desire to check my email. You know, it's, it's 2.30 in the morning. I, my wife's always accusing me of being an addict. Here's the proof. I can't get back to sleep. So my general strategy with the Eight Sahara is just to give in. You know? So <laughs> I struggle a bit, you know. But uh, then I, 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 I can't go to sleep. I'm going to get up and check my email. And I check my email. There's an email from my wife with the subject line... We're all okay. I didn't even bother reading the email. I went straight to the Times of Israel website. And there's a photograph of the synagogue at the end of my street. Agassi Street in Jerusalem. And there's the news that four people, the death toll eventually rose to five, four people had been brutally murdered while at prayer in the synagogue at the end of the street, the synagogue that I frequently pray in. And two of them were personal friends of mine. The third one, Chaim Rothman, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, was my downstairs neighbor. I said, I just wanted to share that with you before we went into the training session. Hachman Begoyim Tamim, say Chazal. Don't, don't think the Goyim are stupid. They're not. I didn't get a word out of these students of justice in Palestine guys after that. Because they were smart enough to understand that I had such total control of the conceptual frame with such an emotive incident that there was literally nothing they could do that wouldn't make them look bad. So they, they took the last resort that they had, which was you're halfway through to all get up en masse and walk out in an attempt to disrupt the presentation. So as they're walking out, I said, look, I should point out I have nine children. It takes a lot to disrupt me. <laughs> Next point I want to tell you is once somebody laughs at your joke, they like you. And if they like you, you're an authoritative source of information. I was flying um, from Dallas to Baltimore last week. Packed flight. I'm, I'm you know, cheek by jowl with this guy sitting next to me. And um, yeah, I'm a schmoozy kind of guy. I say to him, I say, what do you do? He says, I work in cyber security. I said, that's interesting. I'm Israeli. We're the people the FBI calls when they can't crack an iPhone. Right? 
Which got, you know, it was a mildly amusing comment, but it was, it was his issue. It was something he could relate to. And so we started a conversation. He was a remarkably well-informed guy. Um, before he got into high tech, he'd studied philosophy in university. Thinking kind of guy. Asked me some very interesting questions, including, tell me about the Khazars. I mean, yeah, that doesn't come up on planes very often, but... You know. Um, and, he, and he asked me various questions about Eretz Yisrael and the situation in Eretz Yisrael. Um, and he took everything I said as, well, I won't say gospel because <laughs> that, that's not such a reliable source for us, but uh, he took everything that I said as, as, as very authentic. Why? Because he liked me. I had become his friend through humour. It's one of the things we've got going for us, you know. Robin Williams, Oliver Shalom, was uh, on a talk show on German television. He recounts this incident. The, the, the interview asks him, why do you think, Mr. Williams, that we Germans have a problem with humour? He says, perhaps it's because you killed all the funny people. <laughs> Some people are Kona Olam Haba Basha Echad, you know, it's Robin Williams got it, you know. Um, I, I was in Germany, I told that over to a group of Jewish students in Germany, they lapped it up. <coughs> so, um, one of the things we were going for is humour, right? derision. Derision is a very powerful tool. You make a joke of something, because I'll say a joke could turn away tafacha. Right? Moral reproof? <laughs> I can make a joke out of that. Bounces off me like uh, water off a duck's back. But you can use it for good as well. There's an organization called Freedom House. It's one of the most uh, august and well thought of human rights organizations. Um, and it does something most human rights organizations don't do. It gives out grades. And gives different countries different grades for their human rights situation. It issues three grades. Free, partially free, and not free. There is only one country in the Middle East that gets the grade of free. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it begins with I, and it's not Iran or Iraq. It happens to be the only country in the Middle East that people are trying to boycott for its human rights record. Uh, does that make sense? Right? When you put it to people as boldly as that, you're deriding the, the, the idiocy, the moral incompetence of the whole BDS movement. Which, you know... Once you put it like that, it's very hard for people to refute. So, engage emotions, control the conceptual frame, use humour. What's the easiest way to get control of the conceptual frame? I'm, I'm a lazy guy. I like doing things the easy way. You know, I love exercise. I can watch it for hours. You know. <laughs> I'm lazy. What's the easiest way to get control of the conceptual front? This was not a rhetorical question. Say again? Be the first one to say something. To initiate. Oh, we can't do that. We're Jewish. We don't initiate things. That's worse than cheeseburgers. We don't do that. We respond. Our word in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, for our efforts to present our case to the world is hasbara. Right? Comes from the verb lahasbia, which means to explain. Gentlemen, again, if you ever have to say to your beloved wife, but darling, I can explain, forget it, it's all over. You know? If you have to say, I can explain, you've lost. And our national strategy in Israel is to say, we can explain, we can explain. We can explain everything. Just give me a few months. I'll start with Avram Avinu. I'll work down to the present day. I'll include the Balfour Declaration and the San Remo Conference. 
uh, and the UN resolutions that approve the creation of... Oh, doesn't work. It doesn't work with the vast majority of people. There are some people, and they're often very important people, that it does work with, people who are intellectually engaged and want to think. And both of the people like that you'll meet in your life are going to be very important. But what about the rest of humanity? Easiest way to engage is to initiate. Start the discourse. Like I did with the guy on the plane. Right? I do on planes a lot. I was on a plane once. I got bumped up to business class. Um, there was this guy. You know, the good news, I'm flying from London to New York. It's an eight-hour flight. I've got bumped up to business class. The bad news is they put me next to a wine bore. Yeah, one of these guys, you know, all they talk about is wine. Yeah. That's an impudent little vintage, I think, from the, yes, from the west side of the vineyard. You know. <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on. And I am dying, you know. <laughs> but not soon enough, you know. And uh, the, uh, eventually the guy remembers his manners. He says to me, um, where are you from? Do they grow any wine there? <laughs> And I grasped at the straw. I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm from Israel. And on the Golan Heights, there are wineries that have won international awards for the quality of their wines. He said, I've never tried any of those. I must make a point of it. I said, well, you better act quickly because the Golan Heights is the area that Israel's under tremendous international pressure to give up to Syria, which is a Muslim country that doesn't allow the cultivation of wine. He said, well, we can't have that. <laughs> If you initiate, if you know something about your audience and you initiate, then you've already won because you're talking about what they're interested in that helps your argument and you don't have to dig yourself out of a hole. How do you justify Israel's building of the apartheid wall in the illegally occupied Palestinian territories? Ah. Uh. When I turn around to somebody and say, look, Israel has built a security barrier to keep suicide bombers from murdering innocent women and children, how can you possibly be against it? Then I've got control of the conceptual front. There's that great American poet Ogden Nash, the man who wrote the immortal words, shake and shake the ketchup bottle, first none will come and then a lottle. <laughs> great man, Ogden Nash, right? As he once wrote in a parody of the idea of medieval chivalry, he wrote, Twice armed is he whose cause is just. Three times he who gets his blow in fust. Always make sure your retaliation precedes anything else. Initiate, initiate, initiate. Gives you a huge advantage. But it's running against the grain. It's not the way we, we, we conceive of advocacy. Jews tend to conceive of advocacy exclusively in terms of responding to other people. Any doctors here? See, none of them admit it, right? <laughs> and you know why doctors never admit it? Because it means they can't get away from their work. You know, you're a simple or something, and somebody discovers you're a doctor immediately. My back's... Can, could you have a look, you know? <laughs> Uh, it, you can never get away from your work. Everyone wants a free consultation. I'm the same way. I never tell people uh, in social settings what I do. Uh, because then the next question is, what would you say to an Arab if he said to you X? Wrong question. The right question is, what can I be saying to make anti-Israel advocates lose sleep wondering how they're going to answer me? I like doing things the easy way. The easy way is to initiate. In terms of the modalities of how you communicate about Israel, again, avoid the long lectures about history. Not that the history isn't important, it's vital. 
But the problem is that truth is so precious a commodity that it needs to be rationed. You give people too much of it, they get sick. So you have to give people just enough truth in a packaging that they can digest. So that means try and communicate visually, if at all possible. Uh, if you're interested, just Google, Google my name and you'll find my website. Shoot me an email and I'll send you a handout that's connected to the session that we're doing this evening. Deals with it a bit more depth than we have time for. Um, but I'll send you a handout and included in that hand like, handout a list of websites uh, where you can get visual material. How do you get visual material in front of people's eyes? Well, you know, you're, some people here are old enough to remember when, you know, when their neighbours went on vacation and they came back and punished you by locking you in the living room with a slide projector. You, know, you had to see the whole thing, right? So that doesn't happen any longer. You know, now, you know, if you haven't already sent it via Instagram or posted it on your Facebook page or tweeted it, you can just thrust one of these things in front of somebody's eyes and show them a picture. So there are, there are very striking pictures out there. Whether the picture is one of the pictures that haunts me from the aftermath of the Sparrow Pizza bombing in Jerusalem, uh, an empty baby buggy stained with blood. I'll never get that picture out of my mind. Or whether it's the picture of somebody excavating in Eretz Israel and finding you know, the, uh, the pomegranate design that was used on the hem of the Kern Godel's garments. Pictures tell stories. You know, the, the, the aphorism is a picture is worth 10,000 words. Jews have heard that. Jews believe that. And given the choice between a picture and 10,000 words, Jews always choose 10,000 words. <laughs> so choose a picture. And the picture is a way of telling a story. Stalin, is reputed to have said, one person's death is a tragedy, a million people's death is a statistic. The implication being it's easier to get away with killing a million people than one person. Because one person is a person, you can identify with them. You want to get people to identify, tell stories. The story I introduced earlier about being on the talk radio show in uh, Ch at Champaign, Illinois, with the question that, uh, that was really not a very valid question, what can Ariel Sharon do to bring peace and end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Here's how I, how I responded. I said, look, I can't answer that question. That's one of my favorite responses. I said, I can't answer that question because I'm an Israeli. And my wife, and at that time I only, I only had seven kids. My wife and my seven kids are home. And they're threatened not by the conflict you named, not the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but a bigger conflict, the Arab-Israel conflict. Let me tell you something about myself. If this was television rather than radio, this would be really funny. I serve in the Israeli army reserves. At the time it was true. I said, the reason that's funny is because I'm a fat old Jew. And every year my fat old Jewish friends and I meet for training in the civil defense, the home front command. And our job is to do the same thing that those rescue workers were trying to do on 9-11. Our job is to go into buildings that have been hit by missiles, and rescue the injured and bring out the dead. Specifically, what we train for are Scud missile attacks. Iraqi Arab Scud missile attacks, such as, such as the, one that, uh, the ones that fell on Israel during the first Gulf War. Syrian Arab Scud missile attacks. But we don't practice for Palestinian Arab Scud missile attacks because Palestinian Arabs don't have Scud missiles. 
I can't answer your question about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because my wife and my kids and everyone I know and everyone I love is threatened by the Arab-Israel conflict. Let me talk about that. And he did. Because I told a story, and it was an interesting story, and it had got his attention and it had changed the conceptual frame. How many people here have visited Israel? That's close to unanimous. You all have stories to tell. Please God, you shouldn't have the same kind of stories that I can tell. Most Israelis can tell. We, we, we live in a very small country, we're very closely connected. There isn't a single Israeli who doesn't know personally people have been murdered. You don't have to get that far. I was going through security at Hare Airport uh, a few years ago. At that time I was the guy who every flight was randomly selected for additional securities and checks. So I'm going through security, the TSA guy has my bag open and he's rummaging through my underwear in the bag, I want to make that clear. And uh, <laughs> we haven't got to that stage yet, but it's getting close. Right? Um, but it's America, you know, so he's polite, not as polite as Canadians, but he's polite. And he says, I'm sorry to have to do this to you, sir. I says, okay, I'm used to it. He says, oh, do you travel a lot? I said, well, I, I do travel quite a bit, actually, but the reason I'm used to it is not because I travel a lot. It's because of where I live. I live in Israel. And I ha when I go to the shopping mall in Jerusalem, I go through the identical experience I'm going through here. I walk through an arch metal detector, and a guy in a uniform like you checks the contents of my bag. He says, in a shopping mall? I said, yeah, in a shopping mall, because that guy is looking for the same people you're looking for. Because they want to kill me just like they want to kill you. He got very quiet. He finishes up checking my bag, zips it up, pushes it across the desk to me. He says, God bless you and your country, sir. There are a lot of people out there who can be our friends if we present our case the right way. I want to wrap up by returning to that original story I told you of being at the Interdisciplinary Center in, in Herzliya. Later on in the discussion, I was, I, was, I was telling them the importance of telling stories. So um, I told them a story. I'd been talking to a group of Hillel directors. Now, as some of you, especially the students here, will know, Hillel directors are very, a very mixed bag. Some of them are truly outstandingly excellent, and some of them are not. Um, and I was talking to a group of Hillel directors. At the time, the Secretary General of the UN was a man called Kofi Annan. Remember him? His name in Hebrew means my monkey cloud. <laughs> it does. It's not my fault. It's, that's his name, though. Huh? So I said to them, recently, Mr. Kofi Annan said, is it possible the whole world can be wrong and only Israel is right? And my answer, Mr. Kofi Annan, is of course it's possible. For most of human history, the world was wrong and the Jews were right. I thought that's a great line, you know, it's full of like Jewish pride and everything, you know. One of these Hillel directors is taking notes, he sticks up his hand, he says, um, could you give me an example? <laughs> I said, sorry? An, an example of the time when the world was wrong and the Jews were right? So as I say, where I grew up, I was gobsmacked. Uh, <laughs> but I recovered. I said, well, okay, let's start with monotheism and work forward. <laughs> Human rights, equality before the law, restraint on rulers. The Gantz Welt told us, you can't run societies with rules like that. And eventually, they realized that we were right and they were wrong. I said to the students at the IDC, I said, you know what comes out of that story? Let me ask you something. If you had to 
sum up the contribution of the Jews to world culture in one word, you know what the word would be? Civilization. Everything that we use today to measure whether a country is barbaric or civilized is a Jewish value. What did the Jews give to the world? Civilization. What do the Jews want? The IDC, right? Very diverse audience. I said, you want to know what a country wants, what it believes in, what it thinks about? Look at its national anthem. A country's national anthem is its calling card to the world. Any French people here, the French are very patriotic, all the hands shoot up. I say, France has an amazing national anthem. Huh? Alors l'enfant de patrie, un jour de glory arrive. Right? La Marseillaise. Anybody seen the movie Casablanca knows how stirring La Marseillaise is. That's a great national anthem. Great tune. Great words. Have you ever listened to the words of La Marseillaise? The impure blood of our enemies will water our fields. Now that's a national anthem, right? <laughs> I grew up in Britain. A great national anthem. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us. Doesn't rhyme, but it's a great national anthem. <laughs> Any Germans here, they know what's coming. A few timorous hands go up. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles, über alles in der Welt. Germany over everything in the world. <laughs> now that's a national anthem. What's the Israeli national anthem? A tick for the hope. Hope of what? Again, you have to look in the words. Very poetic phrase. Liot am chafshi Senu. Our aspiration to be a free people in our land. Israel announces to the world its greatest dream, which is, leave us alone. <laughs> Just leave us alone. Israel has the nerdiest national anthem in the world. Sounds like it was written by Jerry Seinfeld, you know. Just leave us alone, you know. <laughs> That's all we ask. We gave you civilization. What do we want in return? Just, just leave us alone. <laughs> Even that did we get? Even that did we get? I know I'm speaking to a very diverse audience here at the Interdisciplinary Centre, and I know about a third of the people here in the audience are not Jewish. So I hope the non-Jews in the audience are not going to be in, uh, offended by what I'm going to say right now. For the next minute or two, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to a single non-Jew in the audience here. I'm only talking to the Jews. I've stressed the importance of telling stories. We have the most incredible story to tell. We are the nation that gave the world civilization. All we asked in return was to be left alone. Yet, within living memory, a third of our entire population was murdered in circumstances of unprecedented barbarity. And within that same generation, in contradiction to all laws of history, miraculously, we arose literally like the phoenix from the ashes, returned to our ancient homeland after 2,000 years of exile. What nation in the world has a story like that to tell? If I can borrow a phrase from the competition, it is the greatest story ever told. And you non-Jews in the audience, I'm talking to you now for a second. I wasn't talking to you before. 
because you don't need to hear this. You already know it. You're at an Israeli university coming to a voluntary program to learn how to be advocates for Israel because you know what our story is and you've been inspired by it and you've been uplifted by it and you've been motivated by it. Jews, why have you forgotten to tell our story? There is a gaping hole in the heart of our advocacy activity. And it's not through want of commitment, and it's not through want of, uh, uh, of willingness. It's because we don't talk about that key issue of, of what we are and what we have to offer the world. And what we have to offer the world is a lot more than just high tech. Fill that hole. Use the techniques that I've spoken to you about, not to tell the world that Tel Aviv is the most gay, friendly city in the world, but to tell them who we are and what we have contributed and what we do contribute and what we will contribute to the world. Tell our story. And I'm not a Rav, and I'm not talking from the perspective of Navua. I'm a technician, and I'm telling you as a technician, go out and tell our story, and we will win. That's Lotha.